Continuing here on the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. This is the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and I am here with Dr. Neil Barnard. Today's topic is a very important one, one that more of us struggle with than I think we even recognize, and that topic is food addiction. Welcome to the show, Dr. Barnard. Thank you, Chuck. I was doing some research before we get going on this, um, and it, it kind of shocked me that food addiction is this prevalent. According to an NIH study that was done not too terribly long ago, uh, as many as 7% of women and 3% of men uh, are classified as food addicts. Um, I personally, having been one, could say, well, those numbers could be a little bit higher. But overall, I mean, that's, that's a pretty substantial portion of the population. Yeah, and it really depends on how a person defines it. It can be much, much higher. For example... Um, let's say we're not necessarily talking about a problematic addiction, something that gets you into trouble, but something that's clearly addicting, like a morning cup of coffee. Right. How many Americans would, would say, you know, I have one every morning. Are you addicted? Yeah, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, it, because it doesn't have any moral overtones, people <laughs> will, will readily agree right. that that's them. And they know it's physical. They know it's caffeine because they drag out of bed and they haven't had their coffee and they feel withdrawal until they've had, had their dose. The, the point I'm making is I think these numbers are low. Hmm. Um, I think that their addiction to foods is far more common than that, if not even universal, meaning that at some point in their lives, people get into a jag, a rut, a habit um, that has a physiological basis that has them eating that food that doesn't love them back, and they're they're having it every single day. I mean, mean, uh, we've talked about that on this show quite a bit, is, you know, uh, how woefully addicted I was to food and it was the same food every single day it was Boston Market for lunch it was taquitos at 7-Eleven on the way home with two 32 ounce Gatorades thank you very much Uh, and then it was $20 worth of Taco Bell for dinner and if I did not get those foods I turned into cranky pants you did not want to be around me and the longer I went without those foods the stronger the withdrawal symptoms became I got to a point when I would be two or three days out, I would start to sweat, I would start to feel nauseous, I would get really, really angry to the point where, as I've said on the show, I've put my fist through a wall because I wasn't getting my fix. And that's an addiction to food, food, not a drug, food. But you're pointing out something really, really important. It was a certain food that you had identified every day and at the same time a day. Yeah. Um, In other words, addictions have cycles. So you might love whatever it is you know a person you know went out on a bender and they got totally drunk but that was completely out of character for them they hadn't done it before um and they didn't drink for weeks afterwards that's not addiction that might have been a bad choice but it (laughs) might not have helped them but it's not an addiction addictions are on a daily basis or or even on a faster cycle than that uh, a tobacco addiction right nicotine is obviously addictive um the cycle's faster, you know, so you've got to have a cigarette every certain kind of increment. Um, but with food, it's very often a 24-hour kind of cycle. Mm-hmm. It's a certain food, and it's a certain kind of day. So you weren't at Taco Bell at 9 a.m. It was, it was a night, I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, yeah. um, it was a nighttime thing. Absolutely. Or for some people, the refrigerator is a magnetic 8.30. Um, and you know what you want. Or you're going to the very same store for the very same three chocolate bars, you know, every night or whatever it is. Yep. Specific food, specific time, and that is a, a sign. And and because you see this so often, that's why I think that, I think that ad- food addiction is much more common than is recognized. You know, researchers at Yale, it's funny you talk about that. Researchers at Yale came out with a food addiction scale. And one of the questions on there was um, asking people to rate whether or not they did this. And that is... You have a refrigerator full of every food under the sun, but it doesn't contain the food that you want to eat at that certain day. Do you go out? Do you go out of your way? Ignore everything that's in the refrigerator and go to get your fix at that point. For me, it was absolutely yes. They put a lot of weight on that particular question. Yes, it's true. And and there are others as well that relate to this. Um, do you feel that you've lost control? Um are, are there certain foods where you eat enough and you're happy, fine, that's it. That's not an addic- addictive food. It's one that brings you beyond um, f- this normal satiety, and you're eating it for reasons other than being full, uh, just as you described with your own experience. Um, do you start hiding things or lying about it mm-hmm. um, so you don't want people to detect what you've done? I mean, th- these are, are 
um, not unique to food, but they're but they're common for addictions. And and my message is let's demoralize it. Let's look at it just biologically. I believe that the human the human brain is susceptible to addictions, mm-hmm. um, and that it's effectively ubiquitous. Right. And there are companies working really hard to make sure they are triggering exactly that addiction. So if it happens to you, it's not that you had a bad childhood. It's not that you necessarily have a genetic predisposition, although you may, and we should we should talk about that. Um, but you may not. Uh, and people can fall into this really no matter who they are or where they're from or how cast iron their will is. Before we talk about which foods are the most addictive, you know, what food properties kind of light up the brain. Let's talk about how that brain reacts in food addicts compared to those of a drug addict. You know, these studies that they've done are, are quite staggering. And they say, well, if correct me if I'm wrong, but the brain reacts very similarly with food addicts as it does with the drug addict. We have some fundamental neural circuitry that's designed to reward us. And what nature had in mind was not to reward you for a Snickers bar or a Taco Bell meal. Uh, what nature was thinking of is we need a reward circuitry. For let's say uh, you find just a good, healthy uh, food source so that you will remember where you found it, you'll, you'll, you'll uh, key in on all the cognitive things about where it is and, and remember to have it again because biologically that will support you. Right. Um, the same circuitry, by the way, is triggered when you find a receptive mate. So um, th- these things sustain the individual and sustain the species. Um, it's a little humiliating to think we have circuitry like that in our brains, but we didn't design the system. We're stuck with it. Um, now, that circuitry gets triggered. Okay. It gets triggered by all kinds of things that, that, that hijack it. Uh, no, when, when human beings evolved to have this circuitry, and by the way, animals have it too, um, nobody had figured out how to ferment grains. And to make oh, beer. liquor, yeah. be, liquor, <laughs> beer, wine. Um, but once we had that technology, you suddenly discover you can feel not just good, but you can feel better than anyone has ever felt um, because you're triggering that pleasure circuitry. And, and what the circuitry does is one cell sends dopamine, these little molecules of dopamine, to the adjacent cell. That sets up, it propagates a pleasure response that doesn't just feel good. It, it does that, but it also kind of sets a timer saying put this on repeat Hmm. do this again Mm -hmm. do this again tomorrow same time okay right um and dopamine does that um so alcohol can do it obviously and then when people figured out how to make cocaine you know it's it's a leaf but somebody figured out how to how to extract cocaine uh tobacco with nicotine uh, opiates heroin and right. others and uh, no surprise it's also things that we ingest that we that we call food but that nature thought wait a minute you know, it's not necessarily food you take sugar cane mm-hmm. and you throw away all the fiber and all the pulp and you extract just the sucrose from it uh, or sugar beets uh, people can get hooked on sugar as well I don't think that that's an uncommon addiction uh, you know you go through any checkout line in any supermarket in this country uh, and you will see a bevy of candy just staring right at you say grab me and and that's why I want to get away from this idea of addiction as being a terrible thing um, I, I don't mean to say it's helpful but I mean to say it's not a moral failing um, and if a person doesn't want to use the word addiction just call it a jag or I got into a rut but the idea that person a is a sugar addict and person B isn't wait a minute like everybody can be or has been or will be a sugar addict at some right. point in their life right, right. because it's you it's ubiquitous it's it's wafted into our culture and it gets mixed with things to make it more addicting like sugar alone addictive right but you mix it with a little cocoa butter um, the fat sugar balance about 50 50 uh, will cause the the dopamine neurons to say okay now we're on to something and and there are I believe, like, we'll just call them food scientist think tanks that work for these large restaurant corporations whose sole function is to figure out how to make people crave these items a little bit more, how to get more of what it is that will trigger that response. Success for them is defined by what goes over the cash register. So if something is <laughs> scanned over the cash register and they are making money, that is success. How do you do that? You can, you can modify the fat sugar mixture of a candy bar. You can modify the salt content of a bag of potato chips. Mm-hmm. And you can modify these things to make them more or less addicting. And that's what the companies are doing. Um, and they're pl- also playing with, with timing. Um, fourth meal. 
You know, that's, uh, I, I know that one. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Or, uh, and sizes, um, because uh, addictions have doses. So a person starts out as a, a having occasional cigarette, and occasion they work their way up, and their dose is a pack a day. Or my dose is a pack and a half. And you find your dose. You, you accelerate, you stay at your dose, and, and you're there. So if, if it's fast food at night, there's a certain amount that you want every night, and you tend to not go under, and you tend to not go too much over that dose. You, you get there. And so the scientists want to know what that is. They want to package that for you to maximize their profit. That's Yeah, that's yeah, that's very interesting and, and kind of scary science. Uh, at, at it it is time. scary, but, but if people want to blame somebody, stop blaming your parents or your upbringing or yourself or your weak will. There are people working hard to addict you, and they're, they're going to do it. And, and, and not only do they figure out what's going to be in the, the food, but they also make sure it's dangled in front of you. Mm-hmm. There was a time when gas stations sold gasoline. Now, nowadays, you go and you fill your car and you can't pay for it without being confronted by every possible snack food that's there. Um, you can go into bookstores and at the cash register, they've got these, these same kinds of things. It's because the manufacturers figured out ways to dangle their stuff in front of you and they'll do it on television. They'll do it everywhere they can. Oh, sure. They've even got TVs at the gas pump now. You don't even have to go inside to the store. I mean, they're, they're, fill up on gasoline and, oh, by the way, fill up on these chips, fill up on this soda as well. Come inside. We've got a great deal going for you. You right. get a nickel exactly. off. Um, we've touched on uh, chocolate a little bit, candy. So sugar, clearly one of the more addictive substances food-wise. What else should we be looking for? Um, well, speaking of sugar, you can take a baby, day one of life, and uh, let's say we're going to draw a blood sample from that baby. We do a little little heel stick. We draw a, a, some blood, put it in, a, in a, a tube, send it to the lab. The baby cries. Instead of doing that, I'll take some sugar, put it in maybe a teaspoon of sugar, put it in a cup of water, and dribble some of it into the baby's mouth with a little syringe. Then you do the heel stick. The baby doesn't cry. Really? Or cries less. Um, and people have noticed this with, with all kinds of things that are painful to the baby um, or would other, uh, like a medical procedure, and they found that sugar acts as a little bit of a painkiller, um, except if mother was a heroin addict, uh, sugar tends not to work so well. The po- here's, here's why. Sugar on the tongue triggers the release of opiates in the brain. In turn, those opiates trigger the release of dopamine, the pleasure chemical we were talking about. Right. If the baby happened to have a heroin-addicted mom, the baby was bathing in opiates for nine months and now is basically just in withdrawal. The, the, the baby's in withdrawal wow. after, birth, after birth, and the sugar is not going to really raise the opiate level in that brain to, to the point of, of uh, to be very significant. Wow. Um, so, the, again, the point is, this is everyone. Right. Um, everyone can, can have this effect from sugar. Now, with chocolate, chocolate's sweet. Chocolate has sugar added. Uh, but a person who wants chocolate doesn't just want a box of Domino sugar. They specifically want chocolate because the chocolate adds, first of all, it's a mixture of some sugar and also the cocoa butter is enhanced. Mm-hmm. It, it's, not just, it's not just the bean extract. They actually increase the amount of cocoa butter because if you get the right mixture, it's more addicting and more satisfying. Right. There's a little bit of caffeine in chocolate. There is a lot of theobromine. If anybody has a dog and the vet said, don't let your dog have chocolate uh, because the chocolate can hurt the dog. Right. What the vet is thinking of is theobromine. In a human, it's a stimulant. In a dog, it, it is such a stimulant, it can be, pain, it can be fatal. Wow. Um, there are other compounds in chocolate, too, but these help us explain why a person who wants chocolate wants chocolate they don't just want something sweet right they don't want hard candy specifically. they specifically want chocolate because that's an addiction interestingly enough you can take uh, narcan the drug used for heroin yeah. overdose yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, give it to a chocolate addict and then you give them a tray of chocolate I, I, by the way I don't, I don't mean a person who appreciates chocolate I mean a person who will binge on chocolate you pre-treat them with narcan which is a drug that that effectively knocks it makes heroin or morphine or, or any other narcotic not be able to adhere to the mu receptors in the brain. A, a chocolate addict will suddenly lose much of their interest in chocolate. Wow. And by the way, this is not a treatment. Um, this is a, <laughs> it, it, you'd have to take it intravenously on your way into the 7-Eleven. Um, this, this is a, um, it's a research tool. 
Okay. That, where a person says, no, oh, I just like chocolate. I, I just love the taste. I like the mouthfeel. Fine. Let me give you some Narcan. And if your ingestion of that goes way down, that's a sign it was doing something in the brain that we have now blocked. What about a less processed form of chocolate? Say somebody puts just a scoop of cacao powder uh, in a smoothie that they're making. No added sugar. The only sugars that they're getting would be from the natural fruit that are in that. You're getting it to be closer and closer to just a flavoring, um, which in and in of itself could have some opiate effect. Um, however, what really kicks in the addictive aspect of it is the addition of sugar and the addition of fat. Mm -hmm. The fat-sugar mixtures are, are a big thing. Uh, I was mentioning sugar before. Um, people like sugar, but they like it usually mixed with fat. Hmm. Um, a donut. That's a um, donut. Cookies. People think cookies, they're carbs, they're sugar. Look at the recipe of a cookie. It's got shortening. It's got butter. Um, the fat calories are usually higher than the sugar calories, and in mm -hmm. fact, almost always. Um, but that fat-sugar mixture is what really gets us hooked more than the sugar alone. I would assume... And this is just my own opinion or hypothesis, I should say. Milk chocolate, perhaps a little more addictive than dark chocolate because of the increased dairy uh, quantity? Uh, could be two possibilities. One is, is yes, just um, it does change the macronutrient composition. The other is um, dairy adds its own addictive component. Mm. Now, um, we talked about this before, the, the, the casein, C-A-S-E-I-N, casein, protein in milk breaks apart in your digestion and as it does so it releases opiate like chemicals um, there are lots of other amino acids that are released but 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 as the casein digests certain strings of three or four or five or six or seven amino acids little strings of beads if you will break out of the casein they go to the brain and they attach to exactly the same receptor that heroin would attach to wow. or morphine would attach to. And, and in fact, they're called casomorphins, casein-derived morphine-like compounds. Um, we presume that they are there to calm down the calf. A, a nursing calf mm -hmm. gets milk, whatever nutrients milk may have, and a little bit of feel-good from mom. Um, it's calming to the baby. And, and by the way, the same is true in human milk. There's casomorphins in human milk. Um, but when you turn milk into something that a person is drinking in the amounts that Americans do, you get more casomorphins. Um, and when you turn milk into cheese, the casomorphins are concentrated. And, and that makes sense because when I go back and I think about what it was that I used to eat, I was never a chocoholic. That was never my vice. I was never right. a candy guy. But you look at what I was eating, those taquitos, those trips to Taco Bell, all of those items loaded with cheese, loaded. And I cannot explain why for one person it's going to be cheese and for another person it's chocolate and for another person it's sugar. That I don't know. And, and even among, let's say you take people where alcohol is their issue. Why for one person is it wine and another person it's liquor and another person it's beer? Um, why those things happen, I have no earthly idea. Um, why is it that one person gets hooked on menthol cigarettes, another person on regular cigarettes? But what we do know is that the final co common pathway is always the same. Yeah. It's always dopamine. It triggers dopamine, and then the next day, you borrowed all that dopamine. It's now gone to you. It, you, you don't have it anymore, so you feel rotten mm -hmm. until you can conjure up another dopamine hit to just feel halfway normal. What about processed meat? That's something that we talk about a lot here. Let's The king of all processed meats, bacon. Why is bacon such an addictive thing? Everybody, you know, that's everything's better with bacon. Why? Well, first of all, uh, it should be noted that when people have an addictive substance, they, they don't do, take alcohol, they don't do a commercial saying, buy our beer. It makes you drunker. <laughs> um, it's it's going to get you drunk really fast. I hope not. Um, but honestly, that's why people are buying it, right? Of course. Um, uh, buy our cigarette. It, it will give you that nicotine hit fast. If it were honest advertising, that's what they would say. But what they do is they want to instead create an aura. So the aura is our bottle of wine came from Tuscany. And it was on beautiful grapes that looked fabulous in the sunrise, you know, covered with you. Yeah, or um, our back when cigarette advertising was, was legal, back in my youth, it was you're a cowboy. Yep. Um, or you're a cool jazz musician or whatever. They always create an aura. So um, that's true with food. 
um, Arby's, we have the meat. Um, <laughs> what, what do they mean? What they mean is I'm masculine. I'm powerful. Now, of course, you might be, you might have erectile dysfunction and be overweight and, and whatever, but you're going to have this image that surrounds the meat product yeah. <laughs> with, with regard. So, so bacon has worked very hard to cultivate the fact that it's not just muscles ripped out of a really unhappy pig, um, despoiling the planet and making North Carolina look like just an environmental disaster. I yeah. mean, there, there is everything bad about this product. Um, but uh, they make it sound cool. And it's addictive for a variety of reasons, but c to cut to the chase, I mentioned Narcan. You can give Narcan to Hank, um, inject it into his arm, and if he's a bacon addict, he will eat less bacon. Really? Meaning that it's not just because he likes the taste. It's because it's working on his brain. It, tr it triggers the release of dopamine. Um, and you can quantify, and, and by the way, not just bacon, but with other meats too. But with bacon, what do you have going for it? You have meat. We see this, you could see it even with tuna a little bit, but with bacon, it's quite high in fat, especially saturated fat, which is also in chocolate. Um, but now, a lot of salt goes in. It's salt cured. Oh, yeah. Um, so nobody takes bacon. You know, they, they don't want just um, some raw pork or something like that. They, they want it cooked up, greased up, salted up, um, cured, and that's what they're going to love. The tragedy of all this, I mean, there's many tragedies. Uh, what happens on the farms is horrible for the for the animals it's disgusting for the environment it's horrible um, for your health it's terrible but there was just a report that came out about two three days ago looking at cancers in people under the age of 50 unlike all the progress that we are slowly but surely making against cancer we are losing the battle on colorectal cancer um, and the reason is that bacon is a fad Wow. And we're, we have developed this nihilistic attitude that, ah, live it up. It's wonderful. Let's go out to the breakfast place and just have it and, and treat our sons and daughters to it so that it's part of their life. Let's serve it in schools. Let's serve it in hospitals. Um, the, ho the very hospital that will not give you cigarettes, they will not let you smoke. They, they used to sell them. They don't sell them anymore. We'll sell you bacon, despite the fact that it's a major contributor to the second leading cause of cancer death, which is colorectal cancer.